Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our interview with Scott, Scott Bridgen. Scott is the global lead of GRC and integrated risk at OneTrust, which is uh, the fastest growing software company, according to Inc. 500 magazine. Scott, thank you for coming to our interview today and finding some time from your thank business Thank you. It's schedule. a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, Scott, uh, your company, One Trust, has been in the news uh, a lot lately and uh, for good reason. So I believe we will have a thoughtful conversation uh, on what's going on in the GRC world and uh, how One Trust uh, adds value to the market. And Scott, you, you have been working on some uh, truly innovative solutions around uh, integrated GRC, third party risk and privacy. And I'm very excited to, to chat with you about these topics and um, also about high growth of your company. So when I used to work uh, as a risk manager about 10 years ago, there was no such company. And you guys, <laughs> you guys just uh, celebrated uh, five years, I believe. So could you we perhaps did. tell us a, a short story about One Trust and how you were able to achieve si such high growth from from zero to thousands customers uh, in short time, and whether it's good indication that uh, GRC topics are very hot and uh, on top of mind of boards and executives. Absolutely. So our founder and CEO, Kabir Bade, um, had a bit of a vision. Um, he recognized that privacy professionals were relatively unloved. Privacy isn't a new thing. GDPR, whilst it was a, a, you know, a big bang and it was a long buildup, it, it wasn't particularly new and revolutionary in the standard sense. The rights and freedoms of individuals had long been involved, you know, mainland Europe, France, Germany, Spain, Portugal, Italy. Um, however, the technology side of things that supported those users was relatively in its infancy or was repurposed traditional GRC. And privacy people were not particularly loved or supported in the way that they wanted to operate. And also with the coming legislation at the time, they needed something that would give them the capability to be able to manage and maintain that. And so was born One Trust effectively. Um, I mean, there's a, a great story that Kabir will tell himself in a lot better way, but in its simplest format, that's really what we did. And from there, we approached GRC from a slightly different angle. We started with privacy, moved to security, then ethics and compliance, ESG, business risk, so your traditional enterprise operational and audit compliance. Um, and that ground up or bottom up approach, starting at a really granular asset and data level, which privacy obviously focuses on, gave us a unique perspective. Um, hence, our growth um, acceleration and continued trajectory. Mm -hmm. So what uh main themes uh, are driving such growth? Is it uh, ESG? GRC, privacy, security, compliance, what are the main uh, driver? <laughs> it's a great question. So uh, it, it's kind of all of them, um, because what we found is, is that companies now are focusing on trust. The pandemic, in fact, actually is a precursor to the pandemic. The world was in a very odd situation. I'm not sure about anyone else listening to this, but I often feel that I've woken up in a parallel universe where socioeconomic, political, environmental, um, the threat of you know, security and terrorism, the world has accelerated to this level of sort of distrust and mistrust. And unfortunately, the likes of the media, say, for example, don't often necessarily have our best interest at heart. It's very difficult to find impartial information in the modern day of the internet. And I think from our perspective, what we saw was companies wanted to be trusted. So if you've got a good privacy program, if you've got a good vendor risk program, if you've got a good operational enterprise risk program, looking at those systemic risks and what can really bring you to your knees, all of those active in silos in different solutions or one solution that doesn't necessarily talk to each other is difficult to manage. And you can't answer the question, what is the true impact of our inability to operate? What affects customer trust and employee trust? And so for us, it was a combination of all of those things coming together. And I know that trust is in our name, so therefore it's obvious we're going to mention it. But if you look at, you know, Boston Consulting Group's recent um, revelations around trust in the boardroom, companies want to be more trusted. They want to instill and inspire trust in both their employees and customers. So a short answer is all of those things um, have accelerated for us um, and are all 
part of this bigger trajectory for the company. Mm -hmm. And what are uh, uh, some important uh, drivers? Is it uh, kind of um, organic growth or acquisition, both? What, what is your growth drivers? It's interesting, actually, because um, predominantly OneTrust has obviously grown very, very organically. Um, and in the GRC side of things, we've grown completely organically until a very recent announcement with the acquisition of, of Tugboat Logic um, to become part of the OneTrust family. Um, we have taken some very strategic um, relationships um, and really baked that in. We don't want a Frankenstein platform. One of the problems, and I think uh, understandably so, it can be very easy to buy really good technology and then try and spend a long period of time trying to back engineer it or re-engineer it and incorporate it into a singular platform. OneTrust has taken a slightly different approach. It's taken very tactical and strategic positioning companies that we can incorporate rapidly, but more importantly, add significant value to the customer. It's not just a technology grab or a customer grab from that perspective. So you saw this with data guidance. Data guidance was a regulatory service um, that supported privacy and security professionals. OneTrust incorporated that, baked that into the platform and gave our customers the capability to be able to access it and use it, but still with it retaining its identity. And similarly with other organizations on the redaction side of things, and actually the most recent one with Tugboat Logic, um, they are key, um, uh, it, the growth and the way that we do this in organic and organic will probably maintain a level of parity. Um, we're in a very fortuitous position to be able to retain um, a very high amount of organic growth. So it gives us the capability to pick our inorganic much more strategically. Interesting. So um, one trust uh, named uh, recently as uh, by Forrester, I think, uh, uh, in the category uh, as a leader in the category of uh, governance, risk and compliance plat platforms. So what does it take to, to achieve th this um, uh, result in such a short time? And what uh, have you learned in the process? <laughs> Maybe yeah, you can share. A, a very gray beard. Um, that's I can tell you that. Um, so it, it's interesting. Um, GRC um, and integrated risk management, um, they are, the market is shifting and changing. The traditional highly customizable forms, workflow, and sort of engine off of the background, customers want a little bit more. They want a little bit of out of the box. They want some handholding. They want to be told. They want to be shown. They want some best practice. And don't get me wrong, you know, the, the big four and large consultancies and even smaller consultancies still are very much in, in need um, by these customers to sort of build out these programs. But I think people just don't want to wait for solutions to be configured anymore. And I, for us, getting into, into the forest, the wave, um, and on an inaugural um, entry um, was, was down to a couple of key things. Number one is, is we showed the holistic journey end to end um, and provided the capability to be able to say, look, um, risk is core and central. For too long, people have taken a compliance based approach to things. And it's odd because actually, I think that's more cultural. If you look at EMEA in comparison to North America, North America, ambulance chasing culture of the 80s, very compliance focused, post-World War II culture, ex-occupied countries across Europe, risk-based culture. And, and I'm sure there are some psychological and anthropological aspects to that. And there's some, actually some very good writers that have brought those, those things together and, and tied them up. Um, however, we have just centered risk at the heart, quantitative and qualitative, customers have a choice. Whether you sit on a particular side of the fence when it comes to risk quantification, and there's lots of interesting active discussions about quantitative versus qualitative risk at the moment that I'm really excited to see. Um, from my perspective, it, it's great. Um, but the reality is, unfortunately, at the moment, a vast majority of, of, of you know, customers out there who are following stands and frameworks are picking that kind of impact and likelihood route. And, and so anyway, we give flexibility from that standpoint to meet and match the customer's maturity. So the simple answer is we demonstrated um, the capabilities across what was needed, but also a visionary aspect that says we understand actually what customers want and where they are likely to want to be. Um, and I think that was a critical part. Mm -hmm. So 
from your point of view, what are the biggest challenges organizations are facing when it comes to GRC and uh, how companies need to actually proactively address any issues or, or gaps in their com compliance and risk related to this? Yeah, this is an interesting one um, because I could give you all of the traditional stock answers of, you know, increasing regulation, oversight, blah, you know, resilience and all of the other things that people are talking about today. But actually the biggest challenge is every company, and this has been since the start of my career in, in GRC, which is a long time, is readiness and cross-functional collaboration. If the truth be told, the biggest challenge is, isn't getting the board engaged, isn't, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm sure a lot of chief risk officers and, and risk professionals and compliance professionals say that is a key part of it. But when you come to actually um, utilizing technology to support you in your journey and your kind of upgrade from that spreadsheet, biggest challenge is actually how in order your house is to make that move, to grow into a set of technology to be able to do that. The ability to have grown up conversations with different domain stakeholders about taxonomy, scoring, methodology, approach, workflow, ownership, trusting and entrusting data to the line of business, whether that's risk controls, assets, processes. That is still, and will continue to be, the biggest challenge that people face is not necessarily being ready for a tool, but going into a buying cycle, sometimes getting a little bit caught up in that cycle and the promises of what a GRC provider says they can do, and ultimately takes them through a world of pain which reflects badly on the technology provider, but ultimately ends up being actually the responsibility of the organization, just not quite being ready. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask you a personal opinion. Uh, mm. What, what is a commonly held belief or misconception in the GRC field uh, or that you are strongly disagree with? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> a commonly held belief that's a misconception. Um, I would, yeah, I, I would say that um, ERM belongs to audit. Um, I don't think it does anymore. Um, enterprise, and in fact, actually, we are beginning to see a significant shift of enterprise risk um, not being a function of audit. And I think that was probably more traditionally financial services and more highly regulated industries or mature industries. However, um, we are seeing ERM managers spring up and pop up um, all across different sized organizations because systemic risk is key and critical because the board speak the same language as the first line. This is the thing that's always been interesting from my perspective is um, you've always had the risk and compliance professionals sat in the middle trying to be the translator, the diplomat, um, and all too often trying to take that information and turn it into something valuable. Hence why quite often impact and likely it probably isn't the best scale to use. But anyway, that's a conversation for a different time. Um, and so enterprise risk being a function outside of audit means that someone can spend that time linking it to objectives, not just the long term stuff either. You know, the horizon and the big and the, and the long term companies operate in OKRs now all too often or short or medium term, very specific, highly driven metrics, goals, North Star metrics. All of these different concepts have been around quite a while, but people are finding value in them. And why not be able to tell someone actually properly objective centric risk? Tell them here is the objective you want to do. Make more money, deliver more widgets, get more customer satisfaction, increase our market share. And here are the things that could prevent us from doing so and how that could impact it. So I think it's a common misconception that enterprise risk belongs as a function of audit. I don't, I think that's probably a little bit of a yeah, yeah. Uh, One of our guests, uh, I think not only one, but more, more, a few of our guests uh, shared with, uh, this opinion uh, on our podcast as well. So yeah, this is a very, very hot topic. Uh, so. Uh, if someone listening uh, to this interview would like to, to take one or two uh, uh, major takeaways uh, from what you said, just how would they implement this uh, conception? Yeah, so um, it's an interesting thing. I would say that um, the start small, think big um, most applies to GRC. The amount of times I've sat in front of customers that are multi-domain, multi-department, multi-persona and buyer. Um, and they are saying, we want a GRC tool. 
and you have to present to 20, 30, 40 people with their own um, outcomes and expectations, way of working and direction. And don't get me wrong, that is the nirvana that everyone operates to. But if we were to evaluate, I would love to get access to this data. If I was to look at, say for example, 5,000 companies that have implemented an enterprise level multi-module GRC implementation to see actually how successful, satisfied, um, how quickly they were all able to use it and actually properly cross-functional collaborate. So my, a, a bit of advice would be, um, aspirations are good um, and sometimes people do need technology, but um, you can start with a baseline and the baseline tends to be given the digital revolution stroke evolution we're in. It's not digital transformation. I was a child of the eighties and a transformer was a car or a robot, uh, sorry, a car or a robot or a plane or a robot or a tank or a robot. It was one or the other things. So transformation means that there's an end goal. Well, actually there isn't, we are evolving um, uh, uh, with the technology around us. So um, I would say that given that start at an asset level, know your data, know where everything lives because everything fundamentally in this day and age is powered by it or owned by it. The digital world is so fundamental and then go up. Because once you know where everything is from that perspective and the CISO team knows what you know, they have to do and the infrastructure team knows what they have to do and the controls assurance team know what they have to do. You've got risk compliance, those bottom parts are sort of relatively taken care of. Then we can say, well, actually from an operations perspective, from an audit standpoint, from an enterprise risk perspective, from a regulatory compliance standpoint, the things that we rely on downstream, we've got a better vision of. Um, and a lot of people don't do that. Um, they just wanna take their portion of the process and then plug it in. Um, and retrospectively fitting a square peg into a round hole isn't always the best approach. Mm. So uh, where do you think the uh, GRC or our industry uh, risk compliance as a, as a whole is heading? What are the trends in the space um, uh, you see and what should we expect from you guys in the next five years? Let's say? So, it's a great question. So there's a number of things. Um, trust will become like a trust by design concept we have security by design privacy by design all these different you know, so aspects so trust will become a big focus and factor of that and it will incorporate and include actually how we operate as an organization so the domains of risk and compliance will become i'm hoping and actually i'm not hoping i know will become better funded um, with more resources and more ability to be able to actually um, properly understand how their organizations are operating I think we're going to shift to a data-driven set of environments rather than the reactive and, you know, typical quality of 2000 plus rear view mirror controls that often we live in, um, that unfortunately is unavoidable today, given um, we're looking at continuous controls monitoring and indicators, proper continuous controls monitoring as well, not just automated evidence collection. Um, I mean, there are still some aspects to overcome, whereas we can't get the full range of controls automated just yet. Um, but I'm sure as time goes on, people will find innovative ways of operating that. The use of AI in a valuable way, rather than just as a sales pitch, um, actually being able to make proper decisions based on data. Um, the use of proper quantification. Um, I think all of the mathematicians out there and the people that really care about risk quantification understand the value of a proper data-driven risk in a Gaussian world. So um, it would be nice if we had capabilities to, 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 to that. Um, and I think then lastly, what I see happening is, is that the technologies will play exceptionally well in ecosystems. The sort of function of risk management and compliance management will be so data-driven from so many other tool sets that live outside of its world you think about the amount of technology that was implemented just during the course of the pandemic for people to pivot or operate or function more efficiently, both planned and um, unplanned technology or, or, or sort of shadow IT type stuff. There is a vast amount of data out there. The data currency thing, not quite a privacy lawyer adverts for you on the TV <laughs> just yet. I'm, I'm sure we will be at some point, but I think organizations taking proper advantage of that and utilizing all the data that lives outside of it. And GRC tools are the pinnacle of consumption, interpreting, providing value via indicators, indicator-driven world. That's what we'll see. 
um, that would be exciting and perfect. Okay, fantastic. So I, I ask this question at all my guests because I am running Global Risk Community, which is a platform for, for risk managers over the world. We have about uh, 30,000 members and a large mailing list, so we can communicate with about 100,000 people and growing. So uh, uh, what do you think, how we can contribute as a, a community uh, to, uh, to the process of better understanding uh, uh, this complex world of risk? Oh, good question. So um, I'm going to, quite selfishly, I would say that we need to, everyone does risk different. The core concepts of risk management across the different domains that it touches and the personas that run and own that um, are all relatively standard and straightforward. But everyone seems to do it differently it would be really good i think as a community we looked to try and incorporate some level of standardization um even at just some basic levels and basic aspects of it um even as even things of terminology i've seen very very different between different industries um yes different regulatory uh, and, and corporate compliance aspects vary significantly and i get that um, but risk is risk. You take and manage risk to achieve objectives. That core concept never changes. Um, and it would be nice if we, as a, yeah, as a set of professionals, um, work towards some level of standardization. Interesting point. Yeah, interesting. So, um, um, Scott, these were all my questions. Perhaps if I forgot to ask you something and you want to add that uh, any uh, reply, uh, answer that will benefit our audience, please go ahead. Yeah, um, so uh, apart from the fact that with our recent transaction with um, Tugboat, um, I think it would just be good for the listeners to understand that what that's given us the capability to do is provide um, complete handholding for certification. So for customers that want to obtain and maintain ISO 27001, SOC 2, and other standard framework certifications, um, incorporated, included into the OneTrust platform, that is something that um, the reason behind uh, our acquisition and the capability to do so. Um, but apart from that, no, I think that we've covered pretty much everything. All right, thank you, Scott. This was very insightful, insightful interview, and I, I wish you uh, and your uh, company a very high growth. And uh, hope we can uh, uh, catch up in a few months and see how <laughs> what what is happening with your company. Absolutely, that's very kind. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely.